I'm Donald Tarter of the Sociology Department of the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and this is another in our series of interviews with the Fathers of Rocketry. This series of interviews is called Our Future in Space, Messages from the Beginning, and we are attempting to reconstruct the history of the space program in its early days and to, to take a look at the future of the space program from here on through the next few decades. Today we have with us Mr. James Fagan, who was an American counterpart to the German team at Fort Bliss. Uh, Mr. Fagan was really the first person to receive the group of German paperclip scientists uh, with the U.S. Army at Fort Bliss, and he is able to, to give us a unique perspective on this group from the American military point of view. Mr. Fagan, of course, is now the retired Chief Scientific and Engineering Advisor for the Army Missile Command. And we have with us today, as usual, Mr. Conrad Dannenberg, who is a consultant at the Alabama Space and Rocket Center, and NASA retired. And we're going to leave most of the questioning today to Mr. Dannenberg, since he has such a long experience with Mr. Fagan, but I shall, on occasion, be asking a few questions myself. So, Mr. Dannenberg, would you like to lead off with today's questions? Well, Mr. Fagan, I would like to uh, tie on to the introduction that uh, Dr. Tata just gave us here. Uh, you were one of the very first Americans who worked with the German mm -hmm. group. Can you tell us a little bit the reason why you were in that group, why you were in this position, and uh, how you got this uh, specific appointment? Well, in a, a sense, it was the, uh, the luck of the Irish uh, that I got assigned to Fort Bliss. I had been before working in the Office of Chief of Ordnance as a civilian throughout the war and uh, had been deferred uh, up until uh, a little after VE Day when they drafted me in, in June of 1945, I believe it was. And they kept me on as an enlisted man without basic training in the Office of Chief of Ordnance until December when they decided that maybe I'd better go and, and decide and learn what the Army was all about. So I went through basic training and uh, completed basic training in, in May and was just about to be assigned to uh, uh, an actual uh, operating unit when the officers that I had worked with in the Pentagon during the war interceded and uh, succeeded in getting me assigned to the sub-office of the Office of Chief of Ordnance, which was being established or had been established at Fort Bliss to receive the, the German rocket team. and. Uh, it, as I said, was coincidence, luck, mm -hmm. and the associations I had formed during the war. Was one of the reasons also that you were a specialist in rocketry? Had you worked in the field of rockets before? I or had worked were your, was your main association through the sub-office? The sub-office, I was in the research and development department, <clears throat> and the, the group that I was specifically in was the Bomber Power Technic Unit, but right in the next desks was the rocket group. Uh, the rocket group in that uh, day and age was uh, solely the bazooka. The bazooka was developed so that I worked in the same basic units that developed the, uh, the World War II bazooka. Mm -hmm. That was my only connection with rocketry. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I think that was the only rocket activity that was going on in this country. Uh, what information did you have about the activities of the German group? Of course, today we all know that they had been working in Germany on the V2. Were you aware of the V2 activities and uh, were you in a way kind of prepared what kind of things uh, would be coming during the next few years? Yes, because I had been associated with the, uh, the American attempts to uh, re-engineer the buzz bomb or the V1. Uh, we uh, uh, reproduced in this country from captured V1s uh, a, a copy of that weapon, and I was connected with the development of that program. In, in being associated with that program, I did learn some of the activity that was going on uh, from the intelligence sources we had in the Pinamundi area. But in terms of the de details of the, the rocket program as such at Pinamundi, I was not familiar nor did I think anybody outside mm -hmm. of a few intelligence sources mm -hmm. were. But uh, I'm sure pretty soon after your association with the group you learned that there were quite a number of V2s brought to the White Sands Proving Ground, which was in driving distance from Fort Bliss, and that finally uh, 
uh, more than 50 V2s were assembled and were launched. Some of them were eventually also launched from other locations, but the majority of the V2s were of course launched from White Sands. Did you know relatively early about this activity or did you learn about it only after it really developed and came about? And can uh, you also tell us a little bit about the association of the group that worked with you in Fort Bliss and the people who were, some of them were even permanently stationed in White Sands in order to prepare the V2s for the launch? Yes, well, uh, as you know, uh, Project Paperclip was a program that uh, was instituted at the end of the war to acquire as much technical information as possible about all activities of, of the, uh, mm -hmm. the German Army. And um, the uh, Paperclip project involved both the bringing together in this country people that had the expertise in certain areas of interest to the United States and also some of the material. And of course, uh, there was as parts actually, I think from over a hundred B2s uh, were shipped out of um, various sources and locations in Germany uh, to the uh, White Sands Missile Range into Fort Bliss. And of course, uh, a little over a hundred of the specialists at Pinamunda uh, were also uh, shipped to Fort Bliss. Their, uh, their principal activity at that time was twofold. One was an interrogation uh, 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 function in which both the, the uh, Army and uh, military services uh, interrogated the specialists about the activities going on during the war uh, with respect to rocketry. And the second activity was to assemble and test fire at White Sands Proving Grounds uh, as many of the uh, V2s as possible, both for exploitation uh, in terms of rocket technology, mm -hmm. and later they formed a panel for upper atmospheric investigations and used the V2 as a basic vehicle. And it became really the, the, uh, the workhorse for the very early exploration of the uh, atmosphere that had been unavailable for scientific exploration up to that time. Yeah, I fully agree with you. And uh, uh, many people have forgotten in the meantime that even Jim Van Allen, who later on discovered the Van Allen bay belts, participated in these early launchings. Right. He and did. during these uh, firings and the measurements he conducted with the V2s and even upper stages, in some cases upper stages were added to reach uh, greater altitudes, he got already a pretty good feeling that something was going on in outer space mm -hmm. that we were really not aware of. That's right. So in a way, the V2, these early firings really opened the space age. Mm -hmm. People became more curious about it. And of course, it was finally decided to go quite a bit on a much smaller scale into space. And that's really the next question I have for you. After you had this early association, did you see already on the one side that the army would really come up finally with all the things that the army is doing today and not only in space but let's talk about the missile program in general and of course I also have to you the question uh, uh, had you foreseen already in these early years the development of NASA and the uh, peaceful exploration of space in the way NASA does it today with the space shuttle can you comment briefly on these two items sir? Army involvement or the Defense Department involvement in general even, mm -hmm. and the NASA involvement. Yes, well of course at that, in those early days we didn't envision a NASA as such. We had an NACA, which was the mm -hmm. National Aeronautics uh, Research Group in this country, that was primarily concerned with uh, uh, lifting type of vehicles. But it was certainly evident in very early uh, in my associations with the German group that there was a, a vast future for rocketry. And that, as you pointed out, came quite early. For instance, in the upper atmospheric uh, investigation program, the first upper stages were developed. They were fired off the V-2. Mm -hmm. They were fired down at what, uh, in those days, was Banana River, a swamp in Florida, which is now the, Pat or the Kennedy uh, uh, base down there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, the early activities showed that, that uh, long-range very high altitude rockets were possible and of course obviously could be exploited for military purposes. Mm -hmm. The um, a number of things came out of those programs for instance the the, uh, the whole development of telemetry was a, a novel thing in those days and that opened up the possibilities of, of space travel as much in terms of communications as the rockets themselves. Uh, Project Blossom, uh, the recovery from space, was first developed out there at Fort Bliss. 
uh, again, as part of the upper atmospheric investigation. Mm -hmm. I and hadn't it, even heard about it. Can you say a few more words about Project Blossom? Well, yes. As you recall, the early days in telemetry, uh, the bandwidths were very small. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some things that we wanted to get down off of the, uh, the firings from the uh, uh, atmospheric investigations that required larger and larger bandwidths. Well, we had no other way to do that except try to recover them with a parachute. Mm -hmm. So the first parachute developments and recovery of objects from space uh, was part of that. That was Project Blossom. Mm -hmm. um, I had not heard uh, referred to it in that term, so mm -hmm. the name was new to me, <laughs> but I knew, of course, about these uh, recovery. Yes, I'm surprised uh, that I problems. remember the name of this uh, mm -hmm. long period afterwards. So, yes, it was, uh, it was quite uh, evident uh, very early that uh, there was a vast potential for both civilian, commercial, and military uh, uses in space. And of course, then being closely associated with the German group from Pinamunda, uh, it uh, didn't take that group very long to put on paper some advanced rocket programs. When I first reported out there, they were certainly firing V2s as they were required to do, and they were certainly mm -hmm. asking, answering questions of, of industry as they came in to, for interrogation purposes. But there was always a small group off on the side, busy, uh, almost continuing their dreams, if you will, that had begun in Pinamunda. The, the development of a ramjet mm -hmm. uh, using the, the V-2 as a booster uh, was uh, underway, as I said, as early as, as February of 1946 uh, on paper, and it had been approved, I believe, uh, for official programming in May of 1946. So uh, that type of, of activity uh, got underway very quickly in this country mm -hmm. after the initial group of, of specialists were brought here. I understand from what I heard in those days and what I have read in the meantime that one of the reasons for bringing the German group over was to really see firsthand that rockets did work and that rockets could, uh, could do the job that particularly the V2 was designed to do, namely, namely to be used as uh, an artillery weapon, mm -hmm. uh, artillery replacement weapon. Do you agree with this evaluation? Was it one of the reasons for bringing the German group over? just to learn some specifics and to get a little bit deeper into the program? Oh yes, they, they were primarily brought over uh, for exploitation uh, in military terms. Uh, they weren't brought over for scientific investigations as such. That was a byproduct of the, of the, uh, the interrogations and the firings of the V-2s. Um, also, uh, real early in that group, if you, you recall, uh, the Typhoon was a, right. a, a mm -hmm. weapon that uh, had been developed, so it, it was put under development at Fort Bliss, uh, but in using a solid propellant as opposed to a liquid propellant mm -hmm. that was under development in Germany. Uh, any aircraft weaponry had been under, uh, uh, any aircraft rocketry had been under development in the latter part of the war in this country, specifically the uh, the Nike Ajax program with the Bell Telephone Laboratories uh, was a, a, an any aircraft uh, type of mm -hmm. rocket system. Uh, when the German group came uh, to Fort Bliss, uh, the Army uh, placed under development with the General Electric Company uh, a program called Hermes One, oh. which was also a rocket program mm -hmm. to parallel uh, the any aircraft work that was going on at Bell under the Nike Ajax program, so that we had the Hermes program was based on the Wasserfall, mm -hmm. again a German development. Mm -hmm. So these programs that were initiated towards the end of the war in this country and upon arrival of the specialists from Pinamunda uh, were uh, direct outgrowths of the military exploitation of the experiences that the Germans had mm -hmm. uh, during the war. And apparently the Germans uh, convinced at least the army that there is quite a bit of a potential in this kind of approach, and of course we all are fully aware of the growth of the program since those days. Uh, maybe we should now stop to talk about the early uh, Fort Bliss days, or do you have still some questions concerning the very early days in Fort Bliss? Dr. Uh, yes, I, I would like to know some of the popular media, of course, covering those days is sort of played upon the fact that there was some American hostility, perhaps from the community, uh, perhaps from co-workers, 
there at Fort Bliss toward the, the German team. Did you experience any of this, and what are your feelings about this? No, um, there never was, uh, to my knowledge, uh, any hostility at all um, for, uh, towards the German group. When they initially were brought over, and I guess for the first year, they weren't allowed in town unless they were escorted in groups of about four, and there would have to be a, a military escort going along with them. Um, that escorting proposition was soon dropped. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, the man I can remember his name, a fellow Chris Fox, was the head of the Chamber of Commerce, became one of the biggest boosters of the activities that were going on at Fort Bliss under the uh, sub-office activity. And he instilled in the, in the whole uh, surrounding area of El Paso a great uh, uh, excitement and, and real curiosity and, and fondness uh, for the uh, people and the programs going on out there. It meant a boom to the El Paso area. And uh, they, uh, El Paso, I mean, and together with the White Sands activity, uh, benefited directly. And there was absolutely no hostility. It was a well-received, well-liked operation. And this, uh, this went uh, right down into the laboratories as well. There was no difficulty in, in terms of, of communication, in terms of working together. Uh, these uh, two uh, groups of people that had so recently been, been enemies, you might say, uh, there was no, no, no difficulties that you had to sort of iron out there. To no, I, I can make, not recall any uh, discussions of, of the war as such. So it, socially and private in the after business hours maybe but it was generally all business the the only real uh, difficulties i guess with americans the uh, we were operating out of uh, makeshift uh, uh, facilities out there and it was recognized that we needed some kind of an industrial support uh, to back up the the actual design work engineering work going on in the german group so the uh, a contract was let with the general electric company to provide uh, industrial support in the form of providing shops, machine tools, drawing, uh, drafting, standards, and things of that type. Um, Gus Steyer right. was the head mm -hmm. of engineering assigned mm -hmm. the General Electric assigned, and Gus came out of a big operation of the General Electric Company, and he insisted that everything be done by the book. Standards that were the General Electric Company, mm -hmm. drawing procedures that were the General Electric Company. And the German group could care less. They were only building one of a kind. As a matter of fact, they didn't know from day to day whether this thing would look the same as today tomorrow. So there was that. The only real, I guess, uh, difficulties had to do with professional uh, incompatibilities, if you will. But no, no personal uh, personality conflicts at all. Well, I, I, yes, that's it. I mean, there's the the normal type of uh, of. Uh, well, I guess there was more personality conflicts within the German group than there was between German and American. Right? <laughs> that could be uh, is the possibility. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let me come back to one thing you touched on earlier. You mentioned that uh, there was an attempt to uh, duplicate the V1 in this country. Mm -hmm. And I understand there was also a similar attempt to build uh, particularly V2 engines. And uh, specifically North American aviation mm -hmm. in those days was trying to do it. And they also found out pretty soon that with the completely different standards for material thicknesses, material qualities, tubing, mm -hmm. uh, diameters, mm -hmm. uh, connectors, and things like that, it was pretty soon given up to really duplicate the V2 itself, mm -hmm. the V2 engine itself. And the result of this effort was, of course, finally the Redstone engine, yes. the first big liquid propellant engine in this country, which was then, of course, finally used for the Redstone missile. Mm -hmm. Can you confirm this thing, or have you to no. have some other information? No, th that's correct. That they, they did run into difficulties making a, an exact copy of the uh, of the engine. So their their contract was was modified to indicate that they could build uh, as much uh, within the basic framework of the V2 engine, mm -hmm. using the basic technology mm -hmm. of the V2, uh, get as much thrust as he could uh, uh, using, as I said, that state of technology. Mm -hmm. And that did result in the, in the Redstone mm -hmm. engine. Uh, originally, it was not to be a Redstone engine, it was just to be uh, an engine. Mm -hmm. uh, the Redstone missile was a program that came along a little bit later when we first moved to Fort Bliss. And the directive was to use the, the North American engine mm -hmm. and make, develop a missile that would go as far as possible with that engine. So the engine came as a separate program 
uh, simply for exploitation purposes mm -hmm. and state-of-the-art technology assimilation, mm -hmm. and then gradually evolved into a Redstone missile. And that, of course, is uh, uh, the reason that the Redstone looks pretty much, uh, the Redstone engine particularly, looks pretty much like the V2 engine. That's right. It has, of course, a lot of improvements, mm -hmm. but the basic principles are all the same. That's right. They still use more or less the same fuel, That's right. uh, acid <coughs> alcohol, to a somewhat mm -hmm. higher concentration for the Redstone. They use the hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. to drive the turbo pump. And all these things we are taking from the V2, and they are really an outgrowth of the V2. That's right. For that uh, reason, sometimes the uh, redstone is being called the brother of the V2. Mm -hmm. At least I have heard this uh, uh, terminology. Mm -hmm. And that brings us then again to the question I touched on earlier. Of course, it was fairly early recognized that these kind of things, the building of rocket engines, assembly of vehicles and so forth, could not be done in Fort Bliss. So the army finally decided to move the group out of Fort Bliss, and that of course led eventually to the move here to Huntsville. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit on the background of this move to Huntsville? <laughs> yes, well that again is one of these things that uh, uh, came about by happenstance. We had uh, succeeded in getting an appropriation through Congress for $4 million to build uh, what we considered at that time the necessary industrial facilities to support the group at Fort mm -hmm. Bliss and had a commit, uh, commitment from the commanding general, General Homer, at that time of Fort Bliss, for a specific location uh, for this uh, build-up of the facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we got the money, as I said, and went over to Homer with the uh, request that we be allowed to proceed with our construction when he decided he wanted to have a parade ground located in that spot. Well, he was a two-star general, and uh, mm -hmm. our commanding officer was a major, and the, the, the Major General won. So um, uh, Major Hamill and I uh, had heard about this uh, Redstone area, the Redstone uh, Arsenal that was up for sale. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got on an airplane and came in uh, one evening and, and the next morning looked at it and found it was an ideal situation for us because in fact there was two arsenals here. There was an old chemical warfare arsenal, much the bigger of the two mm -hmm. arsenals, and there was Redstone Arsenal proper mm -hmm. itself. And uh, we flew on into Washington and, and uh, succeeded in getting permission to uh, uh, move the whole operation uh, into Huntsville mm -hmm. under the provision that we would return to Congress the $4 million, which we did, um, which left us kind of cash poor here and, and uh, initially setting up at Fort Bliss. And you can attest to the fact that uh, most of the lab chiefs at that time donned carpenter aprons and uh, picked up hammers and saws and uh, uh, in lieu of uh, cash mm -hmm. uh, built their own mm -hmm. laboratories. Mm -hmm. Well, I find this interesting. I've not read this in any other of the histories of the space program, but uh, you're saying that perhaps if it weren't for that parade ground at Fort Bliss, Huntsville would not have uh, had uh, it's NASA facility then eventually. That's right. Uh, we, uh, as I said, had an appropriation of $4 million from Congress and uh, uh -huh. ready to go. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was quite a bit of competition for, from other places that uh, wanted the, the team to locate in their areas. I think you've mentioned uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee and, and so forth. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, Huntsville, uh, the town of Huntsville was a town of 16,000 people back in 1950. And uh, they had uh, put together a, a concerted push through the Chamber of Commerce to obtain an Air Force facility uh, that was to be large engine test uh, cells. Um, the competition for that was uh, at Tullahoma, Tennessee, and hopefully Huntsville, Alabama. Well, Huntsville, Alabama lost. Uh, they were going to use, of course, the arsenal facilities that we eventually uh, inhabited. And uh, it was, I guess uh, a little bit of a disappointment uh, for the people in Huntsville uh, to lose out on what they thought was to be a, a rather grand and, and expansive uh, operation. And we're not initially excited about this little two-bit rocket operation coming into uh, Huntsville from Fort Bliss because we really didn't have r a much missile activity under development at that time. We had a lot of things on paper. We had some laboratories uh, and laboratory studies going on but no big uh, uh, industrial operation that uh, would portend uh, a large expansion of employment here in Huntsville. So as I said, there was some disappointment, but uh, it uh, quickly evaporated. 
Over what length of time was this move made? From from the moment of earliest decision that we're going to Huntsville, how many months did it take you to, to really Pamela, make the move? Pamela and I came here, I believe, and if my memory doesn't fail me, was in August of 1949. Um, we moved the first convoy out on the 15th of April, I believe, or the, I guess it was the 15th of April. No, I, they landed here on the 15th of April, I forget when they left Fort Blair. And uh, as an interesting side, that convoy consisted of a lot of, of uh, four by fours containing refrigerators that uh, had been used in the apartments. And General Homer wrote some very nasty letters after we'd located here that we had been stealing all his <laughs> refrigerators. Uh, we completed the move. Uh, I stood out at Fort Bliss to wind down operations there. Major Hamill uh, opened up shop here. and. Uh, I moved on the, uh, uh, I guess it was the 1st of November, uh, somewhere around there, and closed out the operation at uh, Fort Bliss. So uh, that, that was a period of about six months. And you were uh, with them when they arrived in April of, uh, of 1950? Is that right? Did no, I came then? here to Huntsville in summer. And the summer. summer. Yes, so uh -huh. during the mid-term period. Yeah, they, they were moved gradually. Yeah. Was, right. See, mm -hmm. we had, uh, the families were uh, here by that time. So the, it was quite a, a, an extensive move to move families and, and uh, quarters, furniture and the like. Fine quarters here, there was no housing uh, to speak of, and it was a very uh, difficult uh, transition. Uh, right. You can imagine a small town absorbing that many people, uh, just almost overnight, literally. And you found the reception here warm as, uh, as well as it was? In yes, the yes. So right away there was uh, uh, a warm reception. And uh, as I said, they, they originally were not as enthusiastic about the promise, but as I, that became uh, quite evident to them uh, very early on because shortly after we moved here, it was see, at that time at Fort Bliss, we were sort of a little project office, even though we were an office of chief of, uh, a sub office of the office of chief of artists. There was a program going on at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, and there was a program going on at um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech, uh, out in California, and there was a program going on in, in General Electric. The three basic missile programs. Carpal was being developed at the uh, JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Hermes at General Electric, and the Nike Ajax at Bell Telephone Laboratories. When we moved here, uh, I say we moved here basically with a, an exploitation program not even a registered missile at that time. Uh, we moved here with a, a ducted ramjet. It uh, was really called Hermes II, and that was our only program. And that was all we did, except uh, laboratory work, development of, of various uh, telemetry equipment, gyroscopes, accelerometers, and things like that. Bits and pieces of hardware, no programs. But having once been located here, the, office of chief, or the chief of ordnance decided that what he really needed was a center to coordinate all rocket activities within the Army, both surface to surface and surface to air. So he assigned that mission to us. So I guess very early in 1940, I mean 1950 and 51, uh, we became the center in the Army for all rocket activity, including the work going on at General Electric Company, JPL, and uh, Bell Telephone Laboratory. To what extent do you consider Dr. Von Braun's input was critical to the decision to come to Huntsville? The, was he very much in favor of it, or was the decision made at a level above his uh, command? Well, I think the decision was made at, at a level above, but it was very quickly. As, uh, Hamill and I went into Washington. We didn't even go back to Bliss. We just went right on into Washington after uh, determining that this would be, in our judgment, a suitable site and got the permission to go. But then very soon after that, we went back and brought a plane load of the key people, of the German people here, and uh, had a tour uh, of the group. And I would say that there was general enthusiasm uh, for the prospects uh, that the Redstone Arsenal presented. Uh, it, uh, of course, Von Braun was, was uh, kept keyed in on all times of what was going on. But I don't believe uh, he saw it until after we had made the basic decision, because basically the problem was a financial problem. We either had to have money and land out there or money and land here, and that required negotiations with the hierarchy in, in the Pentagon.
Mr. Dannenberg, can you recall your initial... Dr. Mr. Dr. Von Braun wasn't a good man at negotiating with the hierarchy in the Pentagon. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, he was not. <laughs> yeah, but I think most people in Fort Bliss had recognized already the need to move to another location mm -hmm. because there were certainly great limitations in Fort Bliss. There was practically no industry at all mm -hmm. in the whole area. So to get any industrial support was very, very difficult. And also, I still recall the sandstorms we had almost regularly, once a month uh, mm -hmm. in Fort Bliss. And after any sandstorm, we had normally more sand inside of our barracks than outside. So I that was certainly, story. of course, no environment to build guidance and control equipment, to build the measuring equipment, which later on became necessary, even to uh, test engines. That's right. So I think it was really relatively early recognized that we had to move out of Fort Bliss. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the location itself, I think no one was too critical, too particularly about it. On the other hand, of course, the Huntsville area looks pretty much like particularly central Germany, the part where I was mm -hmm. born and where I spent quite a bit of my years uh, over in Germany. So in that sense, it felt much more like Germany than Fort Bliss did. Mm -hmm. Fort Bliss is, of course, much more an arid area. And in a way, we really had to adjust ourselves to Fort Bliss. What we had by the time we had to move out done fairly well, so I think at that time mm -hmm. everyone liked it. We liked crowd, clo uh, crowd, crowd, crowd. <coughs> so where we could go over the weekend. Mm -hmm. We had all our own automobiles by that time. So it was already to a degree difficult to move out of Fort Bliss, but I think everyone saw the reason for it, the mm -hmm. need for it. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out before, most of the groundwork that finally started here in, Fort, Fort, uh, in uh, Huntsville was laid already in Fort Bliss. Mm -hmm. So we worked on uh, missile projects, we worked on advanced propulsion systems, the Ramjet was of mm -hmm. course a big project mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Fort Bliss, which was continued here in Huntsville, but which was fairly soon dropped. Maybe you can tell us a few words about uh, the early work with the Ramjet in Fort Bliss as well mm -hmm. as here in Huntsville, <coughs> and also how did we finally come to the decision, or how did the country come to the decision to really build a Redstone missile? <laughs> the, uh as I said, the, the initial project that we had out there was of German origin. It was a ducted wing. It was a two-dimensional ramjet. And we were going to use the, the, the V2 as a basic booster, of course. If the ducted uh, version of a ramjet had proved successful, then we envisioned developing weapons, long-range weapons, 600, 700 mile weapons at that time, which was long-range, uh, from that, uh, that basic platform. What happened was inter-service uh, bickering <laughs> uh, took place at that time. The Air Force decided that in terms of, of rocketry, all winged rockets should be theirs, and that the Army should be restricted to things that had no wings, in other words, just plain rockets, uh, thinking that the strategic mission, the long-range things, would be Air Force, because at those days, the, uh, there was a limit to our visions of, I mean, our, our capabilities based on the V-2 uh, in range. So a decision uh, was made to give all that to the Air Force, and that in turn mm -hmm. forced us out of the mm -hmm. business. Uh, they later regretted that. They, there was a period when they decided that they ought to have all rocketry, uh, and for six months they did have all rocketry, but the Army got back into the business. In terms of how the V-2 came about, I mean, the Redstone came about, Having been essentially uh, legislated or thrown out of the the uh, uh, the, uh, the lifted wing or the lifting uh, the, the winged type of missile, uh, the army decided that well, all right, if the mission is to develop rockets, we better start developing rockets. Well, the only thing we had in those days was this this experimental engine that uh, uh, North American was developing. So. Uh, <laughs> It was the shortest directive I've ever seen before or since in terms of a, of a directive to start a, a major weapon program. A simple, I guess, two-paragraph letter came down from the Chief of Ordnance saying, initiate the development of a rocket to carry the then existing atomic warhead that uh, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission could provide as far as it would go with the available engine, the rocket engine of the North American Aviation Company. So that was it. Uh, and uh, it turned out, unfortunately, that that warhead in those days weighed 6,000 pounds. 
<laughs> that was three times the warhead of the V2, and the North American engine, you see, was based on a V2 engine. Um, that presented quite a problem. But uh, there was some initial, uh, th 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 there was some engineering advances made in the Redstone. It was the first weapon, both in this country or in Germany, that was designed to have a maneuvering re-entry warhead. In other words, it would be a warhead separation, and uh, uh, the warhead would uh, maneuver to its target to enhance its accuracy. The second thing, in order to get as much range as possible out of this thing, uh, we went from the, the V2 uh, contained tanks, fuel tanks, to the integral tank. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recall, the V2 had tanks and then it had a fuselage uh, built around the tanks and it's, uh, with insulation. Uh, the reason that that was just too much of an ex expenditure of weight and that we could get along just as well with integral tanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was another major advance. Um, the third thing that dictated the fact that we had to have uh, a separating warhead was that there was another general in Washington that insisted that these rockets were extremely unreliable and that uh, he didn't want to have any of his troops underneath rockets being fired. So he had a, he made this absolute guarantee that the booster as well would go as far or farther than the warhead because uh, he didn't want boosters falling all over his troops as I said. So it was that kind of, of, of uh, uh, thing that went on that led to the, the characteristics and the development of the Redstone. Some having to do with rocketry, some having to do with personalities, some having to do with <laughs> happenstance. And, <laughs> and of course the fact that the Redstone was developed relatively early and was for many years the only available large uh, liquid propellant rocket in mm -hmm. this country finally led to the use of the Redstone for the first uh, U.S. Explorer, mm -hmm. the first uh, Explorer satellite, and later on it was even used for, for the first two manned flights. Right. And of course, in a way, these activities put Huntsville on the map. Up to that time, mm -hmm. hardly anybody had heard of Huntsville, but after these technical accomplishments, uh, which really were based on the Redstone, mm -hmm. Uh, Huntsville became well known and I think today almost anyone in the United States knows about Huntsville, Alabama. That's right. Uh, it's, uh, could, so, could you comment a little bit on those days of rivalry between the, the Vanguard program and the Redstone? Of course the Vanguard got the first go at it, failed miserably, uh, but uh, what, uh, what were the feelings between the, the, the two groups working on the Vanguard and the Redstone at that time? The rivalry that was well, going on. You have to understand a little bit about the, the history of this. Uh, Werner von Braun, of course, uh, I can't tell from what age he dreamed about putting objects in orbit and going to the moon and things like that, but uh, he never uh, for a moment uh, gave up uh, those fond dreams. So while we were here, when we came here, while we had the Redstone missile under development as a project, and that was his project. I mean, his group was to develop this system. Uh, he still kept uh, a little group uh, going, four or five people, doing his preliminary design. Uh, mm -hmm. Rote uh, was the uh, head of that group. Right. And uh, I guess he had about mm -hmm. four people mm -hmm. doing diddling, if you will, on paper. And one of these things was, well, I, I have to go back a little bit further. Uh, the aircraft uh, problem, a uh, defense problem, was, uh, was a serious problem to the Army. And we had under development with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory a project called Loki. It was a solid propellant, very fast rocket system. And uh, Dr. Von Braun um, got the idea of using a number of these Lokis in, uh, to put together a, 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 a multiple stage rocket system to actually put a, a, an object into orbit around the Earth. And he had talked. Uh, off and on with some friends of his in the Navy, uh, Commander Hoover, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, the man's name, uh, that was at the Naval Research Laboratory. And the two of them had worked pretty close together in, in developing this concept of using Loki's in the Redstone to put this uh, object into orbit. Uh, at that point, uh, the, uh, a number of other uh, groups got interested in the same thing of actually putting a, a, an object into orbit. And the Navy had a, a rocket in development called the Viking. It again, the Viking was not to be a military rocket, it was to be purely a research, upper atmospheric research vehicle. Whereas the Redstone was specifically designed as a military activity. Um, so the uh, Department of Defense uh, 
at that time formed a committee uh, headed up by a Dr. Charles Lawrence, I believe. And it was composed of uh, some top flight physicists and some top flight engineers in the country, all uh, civilian activities, to make a study of which of the rival uh, 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 projects for orbiting a, an object uh, should be selected. And uh, I guess it was with, while there was intense rivalry and some disappointment, that there was an understanding uh, that uh, it would be better if a non military. Uh, vehicle could be, in other words, if the orbiting uh, program could be a non-military thing, uh, it would be better for uh, international uh, outlook uh, and, as well as for the outlook of this country. Right. This was part of the International Geophysical Year at that time, and uh, no, was it? Well, was it not? I don't believe it. Uh, yeah, the satellite launch was part of the IUI. Right. Yeah, okay. right. I guess that did come at that time. Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, the committee decided in favor of the launch uh, of the uh, Viking. Mm -hmm. And as I said, there was great disappointment here, but uh, Dr. Von Braun and the group uh, quickly, uh, I mean, they didn't cooperate, but they didn't, weren't asked to cooperate, but there was no uh, infighting or anything else. However, uh, they came to us with the proposal that uh, we, uh, he be allowed to use some of the money we had to put, what, to go ahead and build one of these things and uh, test out the upper stages and put one in a warehouse, which we did. And uh, the uh, the redstone with the Viking, with the uh, the upper stages, uh, we went ahead and developed uh, as a as you might call an undercover army operation, uh -huh. <laughs> and it was uh, that missile that was actually the first successful uh, orbiter. Well, you mentioned the undercover aspects of it there. Uh, some sources that I've read um, maintain that. Although the American public was really shocked and surprised by the Soviet Sputnik, that we knew well in advance that they intended to, to orbit this. In fact, they had made some announcements to the effect that they would try to orbit a vehicle during the IGY. Uh, what was your impression? Was it a shock to you, or did you feel that this was a development that was expected imminently at that time? Uh, it was a shock in the sense that they did it when they did. I happened to be in Australia at the, the time it uh, took place, and there was a great disappointment and a little bit of anger, I guess, because I knew what was sitting in the warehouse here in Huntsville. And uh, as I said, it was a great disappointment, but not that much of a shock. Mm -hmm. uh, I was certainly glad when I got back to find out that uh, <laughs> the... Uh, the shock that occurred nationally uh, succeeded in jarring that missile out of the warehouse here. That's <laughs> right. It, uh, <laughs> 90 days, man. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Were those yeah. your feelings, uh, Mr. Sandberg? Uh, well, of course, uh, as Mr. Fagan just pointed out, we all were aware that we could have done it uh, mm -hmm. at about the same time and even before the Russians. So in that sense, we certainly were disappointed. On the other hand, as you pointed out, we were ready to go when we finally got the signal. And that again, of course, really put uh, quite a bit of emphasis on all the programs here. So I think in that sense, it really helped to finally make Huntsville what it is today. Oh, yes. That, that's what eventually turned this, the whole program here in Redstone into what is here today at the complex. The, uh, in those days, we were uh, the, uh, the center and the focus for all Army weapon development with employing rocketry. Uh, that program, the arbiter, the successful arbiting uh, of the arbiter, uh, this simply opened up Pandora's box. Uh, then there was a reorientation, reorganization in the Pentagon and in various institutions in Washington. They quickly, NASA, NACA, uh, quickly got into the uh, act and uh, uh, that led to, uh, well, uh, it didn't really lead to the IRBM uh, uh, controversy, but it, it, it led certainly to um, what was the, uh, they set up a, a, in uh, Washington, they set up a whole new office. I forget what they called it. The Manned Space Flight. You probably think no, of the Manned no, Space Flight. No, it was earlier right? than that. It was a coordinating group for a, a new exploitation of, of rocketry. Uh, Oh, you think of the ARPA, ARPA, group, ARPA. Advanced Research Project Agency? Right, right. That led to the establishment mm -hmm. of that group, which was then to coordinate amongst the services and, and um, uh, industry 
all activities in this thing. And of course, money started to flow in. The program developed in uh, all over in the three services and uh, with NACA that eventually became NASA. And uh, the group here uh, uh, organizationally followed that along. Initially, they received some programs from ARPA uh, for uh, uh, space activities. They also, by that time, had been uh, uh, charged with the design of an intermediate range ballistic missile. Um, and the, that missile served as a platform for various types of programs that ARPA funded. And uh, from there, they went into uh, rather large activities in space. And then I guess it was Kennedy. Uh, President right. Kennedy mm -hmm. eventually decided, mm -hmm. well, we better mm -hmm. change the whole complexion of our institutions in this country with respect to space. And they established, uh, they, uh, established the NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, as a uh, successor to NACA. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and up to now, really, all the things we had discussed were still done by the U.S. Army. That is something that most people have forgotten today. Most people think when we launched the first Explorer, that was already a NASA launch. It was right. not. No. It was an Army activity. Mm -hmm. The uh, two manned space flights used an Army Redstone mm -hmm. in order to put the first two U.S. astronauts into space, not into an orbit. Uh, that had to be done with an Atlas, with a much bigger launch vehicle mm -hmm. than uh, just a somewhat reinforced uh, uh, redstone. And only then did really uh, NASA get into the act. And I would also like to remind you, particularly since you mentioned ARPA earlier, mm -hmm. the uh, first two first stage boosters mm -hmm. for the Saturn 1 and Saturn 1B are also based on redstone tankage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm on uh, one Jupiter tank in the center of the nine mm -hmm. tank cluster, mm -hmm. and they use Jupiter engines, mm -hmm. the first IRBM engines. Mm -hmm. And if ARPA and the Army had not started the program, we probably would not have made during the decade where Kennedy announced the landing on the moon. We would not have made it, in my opinion. That's right. Because it would have taken too long to develop new engines, to develop a new booster. But these things were already underway. And the booster, in fact, has been te had been tested already on the test stand. Mm -hmm. It was a test stand version that had to be improved for future flight, but all the groundwork had been done and had been done by the Army. Okay. And I think very often the Army does not get the necessary credit for these mm -hmm. early activities. Yes, I had once had to give a report, and it, uh, I started to add up these things about the first and the, uh, what the Army was. And it turned out that, that you could say that anything having to do with space up to 1960 and early the decade of the 60s was an army program. It, uh, it was the first with telemetry, it was the first with all the rocket, the boosters, the first with the guidance systems. Uh, in other words, space activity was an army activity up until the time that NASA was, uh, was uh, established. And uh, then uh, NASA assimilated the, uh, the group that was responsible for all this activity in the Army and separated out from the Army. Now, as a member of the Army team, could you reflect just briefly on what was the response of the Army after they had gone through the development of these programs and all of a sudden uh, a civilian space agency is established? Was there a good deal of jealousy and resistance there on the part of the Army to the, the concept of NASA? Well, uh, by that time, uh, there was sort of a, uh, not a reluctance, uh, I, I can't think of the correct word, uh, but uh, they knew that uh, space by that time was well beyond anything the Army should ever be in. Uh, that space activities was a, a separate uh, activity that was non-military and that the Army had no business and that uh, we did kind of a fond farewell to the group. But I don't think we uh, were really uh, disturbed at all that uh, they were separated out. Uh, I believe that. everyone rec recognized that there was so much work to be done in either field oh, yes. that yes. there was really no jealousy. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of a disappointment that not all the things stayed with the Army, but as you pointed out, I think everyone really understood the reason. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, my case is typical. I, I, uh, I really had no, uh, well, I had been connected with all these programs in the Army. I really did not fit in with the activities when it became NASA. So I stayed with the Army, uh, reluctantly, and not reluctantly, but I said with uh, 
certain wishes that I could have gone forward with the space activity, but I, I could make a better contribution, more of a contribution to the army than I could in space, so I elected. It was that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that was the reason that you decided to stay with the army. Yes, I, I could. Uh, NASA. There was really no mm -hmm. contribution yeah. I could make uniquely to mm -hmm. the uh, program. And of course, a few of the Germans made the same decision. Yes. I particularly, of course, think of Arthur Rudolf. Mm -hmm. He stayed with the army to develop the Pershing, the Pershing right. one. In those days, Hirschler is another yeah. one, and there may have been two or three others. Uh -huh. Of course, yeah. the majority of the group uh, uh, went with from Baum to NASA. Yeah. I think there was four that remained in the army uh, uh, because their their activities were principally uh, military uh, in uh, application. But uh, when their their uh, activities were completed, then they went back home, so to speak, to the the group. Art Rudolph went mm -hmm. back to uh, NASA and. Uh, Right. The, uh, but uh, it, it was a severance that uh, really had uh, no uh, ill feelings connected with it at all. Do you think this uh, severance is a permanent part of our institutional structure, that is, with the now present day emphasis on the SDI and the growing role of the military in space, do you uh, think that a viable civilian component like NASA in space will, will be maintained or will one day space be back under the auspices of the military almost entirely? Uh, no, I believe that the uh, space activities in NASA uh, has a, a unique role that cannot be fulfilled by the, any of the military services. And while it's like anything, you know, any exploration, you, you got to sell it first because you can't rationalize yourselves into these things. You, you've got to hype it. <laughs> You, you got to sell a program from uh, any aspect that you can except rational uh, reason, I mean, uh, aspects. I think Dr. Von Braun used to say, uh, he had that little saying, you know, yeah, uh, late to bed, bed <laughs> early to rise, work like hell and advertise. Right. <laughs> That's what you're saying there. Right. So that a lot of this activity, the SBI specifically, uh, was going on uh, right here in Huntsville, I mean, uh, with the Army. And, and the, the military, because of its uh, unique uh, ability to garner funds from Congress, uh, is a good bed for starting things. And uh, at certain points in their developments, the, the military usefulness and applications will still continue, but where civilian applications uh, become evident, they should be split out. And, and that's what NASA did, and because of the obvious uh, growth in space, there will always be uh, a need for a very large organization such as NASA and separate from the military. Now there will be a lot of applications as there is today uh, where NASA supports the military uh, as with the, uh, the shuttle and uh, there a, a lot of the orbiting vehicles of course as you're as everybody familiar from the newspapers uh, have military applications. but. Uh, the principal push and drive, once they're initiated, should be with a, a separate organization, in my view. <laughs> well, do you think we have an adequate institutional structure to uh, sort of survey the massive amounts of, of money that it's going to require to institute things like the SDI uh, and new pushes in space? That is, do we have agencies that check other agencies, that verify that programs have a high probability of of working before we invest billions. Uh, what are some of the dangers and problems that you foresee with the, with the program of the future? Well, you've touched a, a rather sore point with me in this SDI. I, I'm not uh, a big booster of the SDI. Uh, there have been uh, ballistic missile developments going on right here in Huntsville since the late 50s. Uh, in fact, the ballistic missile defense activities, the only ballistic missile defense activities uh, in the United States uh, have been going on right here since then at, at a, a rather significant level. Uh, for instance, there was actually a system deployed, as you're well aware, up in, in North Dakota. It was eventually closed down. But the research and development for advanced systems has been going on ever since. It's never been curtailed. As a matter of fact, each year it's, it's gradually increased. Uh, there is absolutely no reason scientifically or technologically today that would warrant such a vast increase in funding that we're getting in SDI. And that vast increase that's occurring this year 
is bound to lead to this wasteful utilization, uh, throwing money into programs that uh, uh, have only marginal possibilities of return. As a matter of fact, the whole SDI program, as it was conceived and concocted and, and put out, uh, should not, in my judgment, be developed at all. Uh, the, this is not to argue that there's uh, technical infeasibility with the schemes that they're talking about, although it's going to be many, many years and decades before they'll uh, be developed. There'll be, there's no question that given the amount of money and given time, uh, these things that they're talking about, directed energy weapons, uh, kinetic energy kills, radars and pointing schemes, all these things that are consuming these vast amounts of money today under the SDI, will, will be developed. But the fact, the simple fact remains that there is no such thing as a 100% reliable anything. And that the vast destruction of the, of the atomic uh, warheads today, it doesn't take, uh, with 50,000 of them available in the world, and, and I guess 20 some odd thousand of them available in the United States and 20,000 of them available to Russia, it only takes uh, one thousandth of a percent to get through that umbrella and you wipe out the United States. Now, to think of uh, the possibility of developing a 100% reliable system is just nonsense. I, I don't know of a military system that even achieves 90% reliability, uh, particularly these complicated weapons that uh, are developed in missiles in space. And uh, so the, the SDI concept is faulted right from the beginning in my head. <laughs> Mr. Hagen, since you have told, uh, uh, told us your opinion about the SDI, I would also like uh, to ask you about your opinion about the NASA program. You know, of course, NASA is ready on its way to build a space station, mm -hmm. and there are some people who feel that space station is way too small. We should have much larger goals, <coughs> and the space station, for example, should be a way stone uh, to the moon and eventually to Mars. Uh, and some people even feel maybe we should forget about uh, the kind of space station we discuss right now and uh, establish a Mars program right away. Mm -hmm. Would you also give us your thinking about the NASA approach to future space activities? Uh, yes, I guess I'm opinionated there too. <laughs> um, I, I was enthusiastic for the original uh, program of going to the moon. Uh, the enthusiasm came about by recognition of this uh, this. Uh, uh, salesmanship thing. You, you, you just aren't going to do these things without some grand uh, excuse that excites the, the whole nation. That program that Kennedy established did excite the nation, and the fallouts from that were, were tremendous. But the, the exploitation of those fallouts, I think, in the interim since the last moonshot, have not been, uh, in my judgment, uh, all completely rationalized uh, in terms of their utility. There's been a lot of effort, again, I think, that uh, has to do with keeping men in space, uh, when really man in space uh, is, is really not necessary. It's better on the ground. Mm -hmm. Then there was there's an awful lot of exploration that can be done cheaper and easier from the ground, using space, of course. Mm -hmm. The space station, and then shuttle, incidentally, has a lot of those uh, attributes, in my judgment. Mm -hmm. We're doing an awful lot of silly things with that shuttle. That, uh, <laughs> Uh, are costly and need not be done. Mm -hmm. But again, they, they've done it. The space station, on the other hand, I think is the next big worthwhile program. Mm -hmm. There are just too many things that you can do in space where you do require man. Um, and, uh, and you also want to stay up for longer periods. Exactly. But the shuttle cannot do at the present time, so that's why the shuttle program is in a way relatively expensive. Yes. Although the booster as such should be, the uh, launch itself should be less expensive. Mm -hmm. But since you go up for such a limited time only, of course, it comes per man hour in space, mm -hmm. still to a fairly high expenditure. Mm -hmm. And I think we are getting close to our last minutes. Maybe Don wants to make a few. Yes, Mr. Fagan, statements. we are rapidly running down into our last few seconds now. And I certainly want to thank you for joining us today to give your forthright opinions on this. Uh, I appreciate uh, your candor and, and speaking of, of programs. I think very often we are too uncritical of, of uh, programs that we might want to take a real close look at. And certainly you've, you've helped us 
uh, today, take some close looks, a uh, look at the future uh, of the space program, both military and civilian. Our guest today has been Mr. Jim Fagan, and we want to thank him for being here. We also want to thank Mr. Dannenberg for being in this next to the last in this current series of interviews, uh, Our Future in Space, Messages from the Beginning. Thank you for being with us. Good day. Mm -hmm.